The Dime is sponsored by ETH Revolution. The cannabis industry has unique challenges, which means you need a multifaceted partner to help you navigate the landscape. ETH Revolution has a team of experienced science and business experts to provide a unique analytical approach, providing services from capital to cannabinoid and everything in between. This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is my right-hand man, Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Rob Wirtz, president of Mock Technologies. Rob, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited to be on, so I appreciate it. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. You know, it's finally that it's not just someone from the West Coast and a bunch of East Coast people having a conversation. I feel like Michigan's a little more West than the other people we've talked to, so... I'm going to go with it. How are you doing, Brian? I'm doing well. I appreciate you asking. Yeah, I think Michigan's kind of like right in that central line, and we can kind of dive into those, some of those concepts a little bit. So, Rob, I appreciate you taking the time. I'm excited to kind of dive into mock technology and some of the benefits. So, for our listeners that are unfamiliar, can you share a little bit about the company? Yeah, so great. So, mock technologies, we're really uh, in a specialized equipment and technology manufacturer focused on the hemp and cannabis space. So, What's unique about Mock is we design and manufacture all of our equipment and technologies in-house in Michigan. Everything's made in the U.S. We're very prideful of that. And we have a really good, unique suite of technologies around ethanol-based extraction, around uh, hydrocarbon extraction, around solventless extraction. So we try to tackle all these different potential solvents and methods of extraction, do everything in-house so we can provide really the customer what they want based on which route they want to go. And then... On top of that, our kind of in our core is all about service and making sure we can do everything we can to keep our customers successful. So in a nutshell, that's us. I love it. So when a customer comes to you and they, they're interested in kind of participating in the cannabinoid experience, do they usually have a technology in mind or is it kind of a, a back and forth and understanding what their endpoint is and then working backwards? You know, it's it's kind of a mixed bag. I would say some people who are very familiar come and they know exactly what they want. We have other customers who come and have an initial product that they say, here, this is what I need. But we always, everything in our sales cycle, we try to take a very, like a consultative approach to it. So we try to back into exactly, you know, how did you get to that? Where do you start? Where do you want to be in a year, three years, five years? And a lot of the times we figure we kind of help guide them a little bit to try to make it so they're not spending too much capital up front. They're getting the right equipment. They're getting the right technology. Uh, for the markets they want to play in and the compliance they want to follow. So it's kind of a loaded question, but some people know exactly what they want. Some people think they know and we have to guide them. And some people say, I want to get in. I have no idea where to start. Lay it on me. Kellen, I know that's your wheelhouse. Jump in from there. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the full spectrum. And a lot of times people, don't. they just want to get in the industry. And I always ask them to kind of do a little soul searching and be like, well, what do you want to make? Right? Because... Each different extraction technology that Rob just mentioned creates a different product and behaves different. There's different regulations required for each one. There's different science on how each one's functions. So they're very different beasts. They all may concentrate the chemicals from the plant, but they all do it in slightly different fashions. So I think I think that's a good answer. Let's talk about processing safety. Obviously, people are diving in. There's some inexperienced operators. Is there different, unique aspects that Mock brings to the table in order to kind of provide that safety level for operators? Yeah, for sure. Safety is really big. It's kind of one of our, you know, our main pillars that we focus on. That we saw again gaps in the industry that we thought we could help fill because you know, with our experience coming from a lot of other very highly regulated markets, you know, safety has been a key for these markets that have been around for 50, 60 years. That in new markets like this, they can be, you know, not at the top of mind of people. So when we designed all of our equipment, we designed it all around, you know, safety and automation is a big thing that plays into that. And we use basically very nice operator touchscreen control systems. And we have, we're a UL 508A panel shop for control systems. We use all UL listed electronics. We're an ASME certified uh, tank manufacturer. So we take all of these things, we build them all into automation, we put redundancies in there, and basically we try to take out the opportunity to let operators forget to do some task that will overpressurize, discharge on the floor, overflow tanks. Let's take out those error points 
to really increase the safety aspect of the operation of the equipment. So that's very, very important to us. I, uh, I want to go back to one thing you said. You just mentioned a lot of acronyms. You want to, could you elaborate for our listeners on like what UL is and ASME and all these acronyms that you just threw out there for those who, who aren't uh, fully educated on what those acronyms mean? Yeah, so uh, UL is basically, it's a regulatory body that really controls electronics. So it's underwriters laboratory. Um, there's a number of other, what they're called NRTL, so nationally recognized testing laboratories that go into that. It can be Intertech, which is ETL, um, there's CSA. So there's a group of these that basically regulate and say the components that are basically listed and certified are reviewed by these NRTLs and they're certified to be safe for use for the environment. So if it's a class one division one environment, a class one division two environment, these are basically one step above a third party peer review to say these NRTLs have reviewed these and these are safe to use in these environments. So they're the top of the line for electronics that are used. And electronics are very important in these environments, obviously, because they have to be classified correctly because with flammable vapors or chemicals, you know, there's always risk of something igniting, which we can dive into the ventilation requirements and the safety on that, that side of it. So that's that. And then the ASME, basically, it's a pressure vessel certification. So it, again, it's another outside body that comes in, certifies our welders and our company to say we can make pressure vessels and we can stamp them. And we have an ASME U stamp that basically says the, the calculations of the tanks have been reviewed, which is all the wall thicknesses, all the weld types and characteristics of the welds, that you get full penetration welds to make sure that these are safe vessels that are really fit for use for the application they're going. These certifications though, are they necessary to operate in today's cannabinoid industry? So ASME absolutely is. So on ASME, that really falls into the hydrocarbon side. And the current regulations are kind of split there as uh, the market goes off of anything that's bigger than a six inch diameter vessel has to be ASME certified. That is not the case for all the operators out there. I will tell you that, but to have a true certified system, and if you have it third-party peer-reviewed, that is one of the things that will absolutely make you pass or fail. And that's done either from an equipment standpoint before it's shipped or if there's on-site technical inspections. So that's very, very, very important. And again, the other side of it, the UL side or the NRTL listing side on electronics, again, I would say that is absolutely critical and required. Is it always done? Again, the answer is no. But as the market continues to get more regulated, and I think as people become knowledgeable on the process, because a lot of, I think, jurisdictions don't really know what they're looking for and don't know the questions to ask yet, as that builds up and people become more knowledgeable, I think we're going to see a big shift of people who aren't playing in that regulated market are going to get pushed out of the market or closed down. And to kind of continue on that path, because we've had some of these challenging conversations. So it's really great to hear you reiterate that for our listeners and more specifically, some of the, the prospects we've spoken with. Say they take a, a more cost-effective approach where they get a piece of equipment that doesn't have these certifications and regulations instilled in it. How hard would it be in order to, let's say, upgrade their equipment? Is that even a possibility to go from one of these pieces of equipment that doesn't have these certifications to that? Yeah, so when I guess... Great question. When you say upgrade, I kind of take that as replace in our sense because we do do that right now a lot. Honestly, we have customers call us and say we bought X, Y, and Z. It either doesn't work or we try to get it certified and the certifying body said there's no way we're going to let you use that. So the problem is, is, is typically our customers will try to save X amount of money. They're spending 30000 on this piece versus ours being sixty because it's 30000 less. Everybody's you know, driven by capital, which I understand, but we always try to explain to people, you know, the purchase gets a lot more expensive when you're taking that $30,000 piece of equipment and tossing it in the dumpster and then spending the original money. So if you're going to be a serious player in the market, we always advise people, you know, take a serious approach to it, level up from a compliance standpoint. And if your competitors aren't, you know, they're not going to be in the market long-term in my opinion. So that's the approach we try to take with people. I think that's so important. Yeah. Kellen, I want you to kind of shed some light on that because of course have, we spoke about the conversation and the story about the guy who referenced his expensive paperweight. So Kellen, kind of dive in there. No, I have one funny story about UL certification. So like back in the day when I was an operator, we were buying heating mantles to heat up some round bottom flasks. And round bottom flask heating mantles aren't super cheap. 
you can get like the ones from China and they're still semi expensive. And I had a procurement guy who found a really screaming deal on Alibaba for one out of India. And so I was like, why not save a couple hundred dollars? And we ordered it. And like, I literally turned it on when we got it and it caught fire. And I was like, how can you sell something that catches fire when you plug it in? And it's because it, they're just manufacturing these things without any certification and regulations. Turns out that it's like hard to take someone's word from across the world that like, no, it'll be safe. Just plug it in and turn it on. You know what I mean? And so municipalities don't take your guys's word, right, Rob? That's why you have to have these third party facility or companies come in and, and stamp it because they're just not going to be like, you're, hey, yeah, it's Rob. We know Rob. We'll take his word that everything was done right. They have to have it, right? No, for sure. And I think, the, I think honestly, the manufacturers in this space should think of it more from, you know, outside of just on top of the, the municipalities that are going to require it. But honestly, to make sure that equipment manufacturers don't miss something, it's always good to have another set of eyes on something. So for your own due diligence and liability, I think it's super important. And it's funny you mentioned that story about that heating mantle, because I don't know if you guys heard the other one in this space. And I was talking about ASME pressure vessels that a lot of these vessels were coming from overseas and having ASME stamps. And it came out of the woodwork that the company who was stamping them were stamping them with fake ASME stamps, and they actually weren't pressure vessels. So it's crazy the stuff you see in the space for people who are saving money. Crazy. It's counterproductive to what you're doing. I mean, they're risking safety in the product, which is crazy. And like you said before, it's one of those where they spend, let's say, the 30000 up front, which will likely be on the very, very low end, and ultimately have to put that into the closet as an expensive paper rate as they double down on an equipment purchase, which is obviously something that operators don't ever want to do to have a double investment on capital equipment. It's just never a good route to take. So when you're having these conversations and they're kind of like hitting their head up against the wall about the cost to purchase one of these equipments and they're wondering about the investment of the upfront opportunity, obviously being highly regulated is so important in telling them the future of where to go. Is there a, a specific fact or a statistic that you share with them to let them know that this is the direction the industry is going and these are investments for the long-term approach? We try to be very transparent with our customers, to be honest. You know, we don't have, you know, a crystal ball that says where it's going, but we basically share our experience and other industries that came up in a similar path. And in my mind, you know, honestly, new emerging industries follow kind of a same path all the time. And I think it's very clear to everybody when you talk to them to say, you never see stuff that's coming out that stuff is becoming less regulated or less compliant in this space. They're always stepping up the bar. I mean, even and the NFPA codes and stuff like that. They're adding more stuff that deals just with extraction. So people are starting to pay attention to it. And if you don't buy the most compliant you can get at this point, you know, that is the best shot you're going to have on making sure you future-proof yourself on compliance. Yeah. It's not guaranteed, but buying the most compliant stuff today is the best shot you have on being future compliant in the future. So perfect quote right there. Yeah, the future proofing it. I mean, that's used so so readily. I mean, if you're not thinking about where the industry is going to be from a manufacturing perspective in 10 years, then I don't think you're building a company for the long term, personally. No, I agree with you for sure. So let's talk about some automation features. Is there a specific technology integrated into the equipment? Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. So our flagship series, let's if we touch like let's say on the ethanol side, our flagship series, which is our EES products, they're they're fully automated ethanol extraction systems. So typical labs that require a handful of operators and one guy's, you know, managing the ethanol chilling system, another guy's doing extraction, the other guy's, you know, overseeing, let's say, the recovery or the decarb process. And for each of these processes, they're basically manually transferring solvent into the extraction vessel. They're operating each stage independently. They're discharging it out. There's operator error, there's labor, and there's inefficiencies there. I mean, not only from a bottleneck standpoint, but I always talk to people about operational bottlenecks. Even if you have a chilling system, an extraction system, a recovery system, all sized for the cracked throughput, the operators can introduce bottlenecks because they're basically transferring fluids or turning them on and off at the wrong time. So you do have inherent operational bottlenecks. What's awesome about our technology is everything is controlled by one central control system. The entire system is designed and manufactured to work together as one complete unit. So to operate our system, you have a single operator. He literally puts the biomass in, selects the recipe, hits start. It does the automatic 
ethanol chilling to the right temperature and level based on the recipe. It discharges it, it performs the whole extraction process, automatically pumps it out, puts it through filtration, puts it in the recovery process. The recovery process automatically turns on and off throughout the day, automatically discharges the oil over to the decarb, automatically runs the decarb process, transfers the solvent back to the front end. So the whole process is really truly automated and it's got level controls, temperature controls, pressure controls, and it's all recipe driven. So it makes it super easy to operate. And the consistency of really the output product in there ensures that the recipe or the parameters that for every batch are the same. And to really show that from a compliance standpoint, the system automatically generates a PDF report at the end of each day, saves it on the computer. So you can pick any day, say, I wanna see what batches we ran, what recipe parameters were ran, and what the machine actually did. And you can prove that your product is ran in a consistent format all the time. So what I think that's that? huge. What record, that record is used for standard manufacturing. What acronym is the that kind of record work with? Is it CGMP, right? Yeah, so it's, you know, CGMP, EU GMP, uh, and it's really just from, from a, an overall compliance standpoint. So yep. for basically for CGMP, EU GMP, everything is about manufacturing processes, repeatable, making sure that your process is the same every time you do it. And while you can achieve that with manually operated processes, the process control there and the documentation can become overwhelming, should I say. And I think as the market continues to mature and things continue to move more toward like a pharmaceutical style manufacturing operation, those are going to be paramount in people's success. I couldn't agree more. I think that's so important to kind of shed more light on because as these small organizations try to scale and they have to go from, let's say, one key employee to multiple key employees, if that key employee is sick that day and he usually does a different tweaking to the SOP, I mean, now the end product is going to be slightly different. So when you've automated the entire process, you can adhere to really, really strict QA, QC guidelines and then make sure that if things do go wrong, you've got a detailed record on going back and exactly identifying the parameters that, that went wrong. And I, I think that's so critical. And once again, I'll ask this question, even though the answer is very clear, is CGMP, EU GMP, necessary now or necessary more in the future? I think it's necessary now. I do. I think the major players are adhering to that now, and that is their goal. So I think it's very important now. I think it's 100% absolutely necessary in the future. I mean, I, I kind of give talk to people about, you know, when we're talking about a pharmaceutical side, I, you know, kind of give them the, the story of, you know, there's no way pharmaceutical companies are having people dose their ingredients into capsules using a little shovel and pouring it in. You know, that is not the route. So it's, you know, we have to think along those lines of sure they could do it, but that is not the route. That is, that no. is unacceptable. So that's such a good analogy. <laughs> the visible, like thinking about like actually that experience is so alarming in the same regard. And actually is, what happens it? in, in, yeah, and what happens in our space too, from an end product, of course there's inconsistencies. There's human error continually throughout the process, which is always causing issues. So Kellen, kind of expand on that. CGMP, EU GMP. Obviously it's really, really strict <laughs> to get there, but it's one of those where exactly like Rob's saying is the direction of where the industry is likely headed. Yeah, I know. And I think Rob touched on all of it. The only thing that I would want to kind of, uh, point out as well would be it's definitely needed now because if you're trying to build a brand around a, a specific product, it's paramount that that product behaves the same every time you go to kind of display it in front of the consumer, right? Whether you're in California or Colorado or hopefully maybe one day New York if they ever decide to sell something. <laughs> you like that little shot, Ryan? <laughs> That one, that's, def Here you go. that's definitely getting edited out. We're definitely edited out. <laughs> <laughs> Just ruined his day. I mean, it really, really is important for building a brand that people will come back to, right? If they like this specific product because it gives them this experience. And I mean, we're talking about um, derivative products. So it's a chemical, chemical profile, if you will. And we could get into entourage effects and all of these other things that research scientists are, are studying right now and figuring all that stuff out for us. But if you want to generate a chemical that or a product that creates the same experience time and time again, it's going to have to have the exact same concentration of chemicals. And the only way to do that is to maintain consistencies through automation, in my opinion, right? Because that's that's the only way that pharmaceuticals have been able to 
to facilitate the exact same product every time. I mean, you go buy ibuprofen in California and you buy ibuprofen in France, identical molecules and almost identical recipes. And that's only made possible because the pharmaceutical companies are following CGMP and EU GMP guidelines to ensure that their processes are the same every single time. So that, I mean, I think that's the only main point I want to make as far as CGMP goes. It's not just to to be a taxing event for operators. It's it's meant to help operators monitor their process so that they can ensure trust in the consumer's minds. Yeah, I was going to say for sure, I agree with you. I was going to just, you you touched on it right at the end there, just about, I mean, the process is really just to ensure the, the safety of the product safety, and the repeatability yeah. for the consumers, you know? Yeah, safety is a huge part of that as well. Also, to kind of expand on that, when you pick up a product, right, and you have that type of difference, you start to have this off-putting experience and wondering, you know, what was the, the reasoning behind that? And especially with, with all the legacy markets and all these other products out there, some, sometimes people kind of wonder if there is enough regulations going on and what else is needed in the space. So I agree 100% that it's, it's so important from an end consumer standpoint to have a consistent, safe product so that they can avoid some of these stigmas that have plagued this industry with some of the numerous stigmas that have plagued this industry for, for a really long time. For sure. Agree. Let's stay with the end consumers. When they're making a selection of a product in the dispensary, do you think it's clear for them to understand the, the differences in the products that are ethanol extracted or BHO extracted? You know, I think it depends on the level of the consumer. I think if the consumer understands the extraction process and knows basically which products are typically processed, let's say through BHO, which unique or more connoisseur products that are made there, then they will understand that. I think just first time consumer off the street walking in, I'm sure they probably don't know, honestly, that there's even BHO or ethanol or any of these extraction methods. They're just looking at a product and probably taking you know, the advice of, let's say the, the bud tender, whoever's there at the dispensary of, here's what I'm looking for. Here's kind of the problem I wanted to solve. What do you kind of suggest? And they're probably go through the process of how, how do you want to actually use the, the concentrate? I think it depends on the user's level of knowledge within the space. Yeah. And I would even go further and say probably 80% of consumers out there in the cannabis world couldn't tell you what ethanol is or what BHO really even means from an acronym perspective. Even if you said butane, they'd be like, oh, like what's in my lighter, right? Like they don't understand the chemical differences in these solvents, let alone what the those chemical characteristics from a solvent perspective mean as far as the active chemicals you're pulling out of the plant. I mean, operators would love to plant their flag and they will all die on those hills, right? Like the operators will die. If you, if you have a really robust or like passionate BHO operator, like he will die on that hill about yeah. how BHO is better. And the same goes for ethanol and CO2, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Sure. Like they, they become, they fall in love with it. And there's little characteristics that they kind of hold on to. And they, they literally plant their flag and they're like, no, this is better for X, Y, Z. And they all have those kind of um, buzzwords, if you will, in terms of what, why they believe one product is better than the other. But I agree with you. I think the, there is one thing that I, you know, I, hope in the future, the, the industry gets better at. And that is, you know, you, you read a lot of articles, you see a lot of stuff, and it seems like companies who manufacture one technology or one solvent extraction technology are bashing the other ones. Yes. And usually there's not a lot of, I guess, truth to it. I mean, like you always hear people, we get it all the time of somebody says, you know, I want CO2 because it's solventless. They said, you don't want to use ethanol in the product. And then we ask them, well, are you going to winterize the product? Are you going to make a distillate? Yeah, we are. Then while you're introducing a solvent at that point, they say, well, no, they, they, you know, I, I heard it's different. It's, it's not the same and it's incorrect information being put out there. So I think people are getting led astray a little bit. And I think it's, it's a little bit, you know, shame on the manufacturers that they're doing that again, to promote their own product in some aspect, rather than kind of give truthful information out there. That's more realistic. So people can really understand the different processes and what the difference is between them, you know, rather than, I guess, bash the ones back and forth. I couldn't agree more. I mean, when I was an operator, I ran as many different solvents as I could because I was thinking diversification of products. You're going to get more consumers and you're going to build a stronger business. Yep. The classic same, same, but different. Same, same, but different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> So, Kellen, kind of expand on that. For our listeners who are unfamiliar with BHO versus ethanol versus CO2, the end product, can you kind of give them like a real simplified version of what the differences would be from an end product standpoint? 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of evolved a lot over the last five or six years, right? Significantly, if you will. When I first got into the industry, distillate really wasn't a thing and people were selling CO2 oil as like winterized oil is what it was called. It was called amber at the time. And uh, they were just putting that into vape pens and selling vape pens. And that's where the majority of CO2 oil kind of found its place. And then ethanol wasn't even really on the scene yet. Hydrocarbon, DHO, propane, or butane and propane kind of mixtures has always been the main market for that has always been like your heavy user, your dabber, if you will. And they are going to be the one of the more robust consumers, in my opinion. Like they're the consumer that's showing up every single week and buying a gram every single week, if not more more often, but they're not going to be buying massive quantities, and you're not going to have this this mass adoption that we were seeing with with like vape pens, where the soccer mom feels more comfortable with a vape pen in her hand than taking a dab because a dab is a very interesting way to consume. <laughs> I mean, anytime you got to let's just <laughs> we just want to touch on that real quick. Like anytime you bust out a torch and like a glass rig and you look at someone and you're like, no, it's going to be fine. Like, it'll be totally fine. Like, you're going to be looked at with some questions for sure. <laughs> it's like, there's going to be some people that are not the most comfortable with consuming something with those tools involved, if you will. But yeah, at the end of the day, hydrocarbon has been around forever. And I think, I don't think it's going anywhere because it does create some of the most representative chemical profiles of the actual plant itself. Um, if you just look at some of the, the scientific characteristics of how a hydrocarbon extraction is executed, it's lower temperatures, lower pressures than CO2. The, the hydro, hydrocarbon under those parameters is a very, very, very good solvent. And so it does a great job of capturing almost the entire phytochemical profile of a cannabis plant. So you're going to get some of the most accurate chemical profiles from a concentrate to flower perspective that's unadulterated in, in hydrocarbon extraction. And with ethanol, in my opinion, I think ethanol is the easiest to scale, right? So I think that ethanol automation and scaling it into like true industrial processes are where ethanol's purpose is. And I think that that's, that's really good for lowering the, the cost of all of these other products, right? Like that chemical profile that's consumed through a dab and a concentrate form isn't something that's the best suited for creating the other, all the other derivative products like topicals and edibles and tinctures. And I think that that's where ethanol kind of fits in personally. I mean, Rob, what is your take on all of this stuff? No, I, I 100% agree with you. I mean, any anytime we talk to somebody about, you know, what part of the market are you trying to go after? They're trying to make unique products, obviously, live resin, shatters, um, those type of products. We say, yep, BHO is the way to go. If they're talking about, I want to process a thousand pounds a day, I want to make bulk distillate, we're going to sell to the market, we're going to make, you know, gummies and vapes and these other items. We say, well, you know, ethanol wins every day of the week there. So I think it depends on what they, what product they want to make. And that's kind of where we try to take our approach to really understand their business and really the underlying aspects of why they want to make those products. So it's not just the first product they read about why they really want to make those and really what drives them to their business decisions. So we can help guide them to make sure they're making the right decisions. But I agree for sure. I think every solvent has its place. So I, I, I never take the approach of it's this solvent, all the other ones are horrible. It's, well, what are you trying to make? And here's the actual best solution for that product. I was a part of a company that was heavily invested in CO2. And like, okay, yeah, CO2, the product was had its place in the market. But like, once I executed that process, I had biomass that still had active cannabinoids in them. And that's why we ended up going towards ethanol. So like, there's a place to have both or even all three different extraction <laughs> systems in one facility so that like you do this with it and then the biomass goes over so you can capture more of the cannabinoids out of it. And is that something that you guys kind of see uh, becoming more common in the industry? It is. So I think it's very common. I think it's going to be continue to get more common. The most common aspect I typically see, I typically see solventless trichome separation equipment, hydrocarbon equipment, and then ethanol equipment. I typically see those three processes in larger facilities as the three most common as a package that I see. 
So you mentioned solventless. We haven't really touched on that. You want to kind of go into some of the guys, your guys' solventless technology and elaborate a little more on that? Yeah. So we have we have a couple of different solventless technologies. The first one I mentioned that's more common that's kind of been out there in the industry is, you know, let's call it ice water, bubble hash, trichome separation equipment, which is a more historical product that's been out there. There's some unique nuances that we have in our products um, for that type of equipment that we can offer people. But the other side of the solventless thing that we think has a huge place in the market is our solventless terpene extraction equipment. Because for people who really want to keep cannabis-derived terpenes, typically in an ethanol process, as you process it through, you hit it with solvent, you put it through recovery. And then if you put it through distillation, you strip those terps out. You're degrading them throughout that whole process. So there's a very, very, very valuable part of that plan. And I think as research continues to go down, you mentioned the entourage effect and basically the combination of these compounds together. I think more and more stuff is going to come to light that all of these things, it's not just, you know, the THC level in the oil that people want. It's all these other terpenes and compounds that go together to create this full experience with the product. And I think People who really want that, if they have good material and they have the terpenes present, our solution is amazing because it pulls them out, doesn't decarb it, doesn't disturb the any of the cannabinoids. So then you can put those through a typical extraction process and you have two extremely valuable streams that you can either keep separate or you can put back together and you're actually using cannabis-derived terpenes rather than terpenes that come from other botanical plants that aren't cannabis-derived. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on in the market that I think is going to continue to make that an extremely, extremely valuable process for people going forward. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's perfectly said. So I want to switch gears slightly. Rob, what is one concept about extraction that operators or end consumers would be surprised or shocked to learn? Honestly, I think consumers would probably be shocked to learn if they understood the level of operator innovation in traditional processes, to be honest. I think they would be very shocked to learn to watch somebody operate a BHO machine because there's a lot that goes into it, a lot they have to monitor, a lot of valves they're turning, and there's a, a lot of operator intervention in running that equipment. I think people probably, you know, blow by the actual work that goes into the back end of these products. I think horrified might be like a, a better way to describe that. <laughs> I'm trying to be uh, maybe a little more politically correct. Yeah, here. no, you're you're absolutely you're absolutely correct, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's one that I mean, even I take for granted to think about. You know how how many different variables could going on, but you know, speaking with with individuals like yourself and and Kellen continually has just made me you know surprised for sure to learn, and I'm I'm glad that you shared that. Are we going to take a, a quick moment and just show some respect to all the operators out there that are making the products back there and those. C1, yeah, B1 right. rooms, pulling all those valves. Cause like, <laughs> we appreciate it's quite the you. job. We yeah. appreciate it. It is. It is. And you know, there's magic back there. But there people, is. You know, Playing with explosive gases and just cold. And people are passionate about it. Which, which Ice is in their veins. Ice yeah. in their veins. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is. And that's one thing that's funny that you talk about that because we get that question sometimes and people are saying, well, we don't want to automate the process because you're taking away our job. You're taking away our expertise. And you know, my, my response to all that is, is no, I'm not. I'm not trying to do any of that. I'm trying to make the process more repeatable, more consistent. And I want you to be able to use your expertise to have more value add to the company you're working for, to your company, to whatever it might be. So your value can be better used in somewhere else rather than monitoring the process that we can automate based on your recipe and your expertise, what you love. Let's simplify, automate that process, use your knowledge and your skill and your time on other value adds in the organization. Separate R and D from production. I think yes. is something that is so hard for a lot of operators to do. They just get so attached, and they're like, "Well, if I tweak it this little time, it's like, no, we are running this material the same because of how we did it last time." So, like, you can figure sure. out a new way to do it next time we do this. Like, for sure. Since you've been in the cannabinoid industry, what has been the biggest misconception? You know, I don't think it's a misconception anymore, but I will say, I think probably like most people, when you enter the space, and I think there was a lot of incorrect knowledge. People are becoming more comfortable with the space. But I think I think there was a big misconception about between CBD and THC, to be honest, with consumers. And I think there was a big misconception about kind of the legality of THC and the uncomfortableness of people working on products to deal with that. Really well said. Before we do predictions, we ask all of our guests, if you could sum up your experience in a main takeaway or lesson learned, 
to pass onto the next generation, what would it be? Gosh, in this space, you know, it's honestly, this space has been a wild ride. It's, uh, it's <laughs> Amen. Amen. changing so quickly. It's crazy. I guess my experience is don't ever take your foot off the gas. Uh, always make sure you're looking forward to what is next from a compliance, from a regulatory. How can you help drive the industry forward rather than try to melt off what's there? Love it. All right. Prediction time. Rob, it's 2025. What has changed with extraction technology? 2025, I think the manual intervention will be almost eliminated. I think the extraction technology will be in all the major players. It's going to be more of a clean room environment. It's going to be more CGMP driven. And honestly, I think there's going to be, like he kind of said before, I think it's the R&D is going to be out. It's going to be more production. And I think that's going to be split into two different sectors. I think there's going to be production facilities that produce very repeatable products. And I think there's going to be R&D facilities to try to develop what's next for products. Kellen? I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think automation is coming faster than people realize. And I think that the methods that more established manufacturing industries have employed to move themselves forward, like pharma, oil and gas, food and bev, I think that they will find their way into cannabis manufacturing quicker than anyone anticipates. And we're going to see almost fully automated, really, really, really finite, like really heavily controlled extraction processes that are generating products that are predictable and consistent. So, I mean, it's kind of the same thing Rob said, but I like, you know, if you believe it, like, why not just keep pouring it on top? What do you think, Ryan? One thing just on top of that, that you mentioned that I like is, you know, I always tell people, because people are always afraid of, you know, the big food and bad companies coming in, pharmaceuticals companies coming in. And I agree, I think they're definitely going to enter the market. But another side of that I always talk to people on is, yeah, you know, depending on when they're going to enter the market is depending on when there's going to be a need for them in the market. If consumers continue to go down and kind of do more of the unregulated processes that they don't get on board with automation, they don't keep trying to level up the industry, they don't drive that, somebody will come in and make a major shift. So I think it's on the people within the industry to keep pushing it forward. I think the more the people who are in it now can push that, push automation and keep pushing compliance, we'll start to make more barriers of entry of other people and less requirements for big players to come in and sweep everything. I think that's so important, right? Because we have a chance since you're in the space now, you've got a, a substantial start and a lead. And if you can adhere to where the industry is going, you're right. You can keep yourself in striking distance, or at least give yourself a real chance to compete when these big players come in. Because if they do come in, they're going to have two options, right? They can either buy people up in the space, which they likely do in order to expedite the process into the industry, or they got to start from square one. And we talked about today, it's challenging. There's a whole bunch of opportunities and let's say a learning curve that goes into the industry that if you haven't operated in cannabis, you kind of sometimes don't recognize the the massive hurdles and the challenges that just come from just by operating in the space. And to kind of take my swap at the predictions, I would say the regulations and the certifications like we've talked about today, where people have that choice between like going with the cheaper option or with the one that's more forward thinking, I think by the 2025, those options will be really heavily swayed towards the more certified piece of equipment. I don't want to have conversations with operators where I'm not interested in having conversations with operators now who are looking to kind of save money now and figure it out later because those are the type of partners that are making the industry more challenging and also hurting the end customer, I think, in the long term. So my hope is that by 2025, everyone is on board with regulations. We're a little closer to kind of the distinct route of where we need to go and the path is cleaner and everyone's kind of adhering to that. No, that's great. I agree. So Rob, for our listeners who are interested in learning more and getting in touch, where can they connect with you? Yeah, so they can they can visit our website. It's www.mocktechnologies.com uh, or they can email me. My email is rwirtz at mocktechnologies.com uh, or our phone numbers on our website. They can call in and talk to our sales or technical team and see how we can help them. Appreciate the time, Rob. We'll link it all up in the show notes. Talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you, guys.